I don't remember ever studying the book of Habakkuk. I, I remember that he's a minor prophet. I remember as a kid when I had to say the books of the Old Testament, I take that deep breath and go to Genesis, and then suddenly I go, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zechariah, Mal Malachi. You know, you finish out the last five books. But he's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. It's a small book, only three chapters. I encourage you, if you haven't read it in a while, sometime this week, sit down and go through and read the three chapters all together in one setting. It should only take you about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, but after studying it, it's a, it's a precious book uh, that we found. Uh, as I mentioned, it's one of the minor prophets. It's probably written around 60, 640 to 615, just before the fall of Assyria and the rise of Babylon. So, what is Habakkuk's issue? So Habakkuk was a prophet, a preacher. However, his books, this, his book contains none of his sermons. Okay? If we go to Isaiah, Isaiah is full of sermons. If we go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel is full of prophecies. But we don't see that in Habakkuk. Habakkuk's a great little book because it's basically like a diary. Habakkuk has a conversation with God. He asks God the question, God answers him. He asks him another question for clarification, and God responds back. And so it's this back and forth, so it's very unique uh, to that. But he really had an issue, right? And his issue was he was overwhelmed by what he saw in his culture that day, right? We remember that Judah, at this point, Judah and Jerusalem had, had really become very wicked. And, and Habakkuk, ministering to them and prophesying to them, it really got to a point where he was overwhelmed. His culture, right, his culture they lived in had deteriorated so much that he really didn't know if he could continue coping in just the day-to-day -day life. Because everywhere he looked, right, everywhere he looked in Jerusalem, he didn't see things of God. He didn't understand why God was allowing things uh, to get so bad. He, he didn't know how long he could keep up his courage, right? He was kind of hanging on by his fingertips. I guess my first question is, can we relate to Habakkuk's problem? Can you imagine living somewhere that the, the moral compass of the culture did not follow God's moral compass, right? I think it's a great book for us to look at the way things are today, but have you ever, can, can you relate? Have you ever felt, uh, have you ever had a moment where you felt overwhelmed? Have you ever had a moment where you felt heartbreak about what was going on? Uh, I think all of us, I think it's understandable that certain times we get depressed and distressed about those things that are happening around us. And that's where Habakkuk uh, was, right? The great thing about the book, though, is that in three chapters, we see a process in which we can overcome. The first two chapters is this conversation going on between Habakkuk and God, and in the third chapter, after processing everything, he writes a hymn about it. So in two chapters, we can get insight on, on how we kind of uh, how, how we kind of get across. So let's think about this whole idea of pro processing the problem, right? So Habakkuk, the simple two-way conversation. Verses two to four, Habakkuk told the Lord his complaint. Verses five through eleven, God responds. Habakkuk still confused, spends verses 12 through 17 asking God further questions. Chapter 2, verses 2 through 20, God responds, responds back and gives him more uh, confirmation. So uh, Habakkuk absorbs this information, thinks it through, adjusts his thinking, regains his perspective, and his uh, morale, and then he wrote a hymn of praise. So chapter 3, verses 1 through 19, that's that hymn of pra uh, praise that he writes. So my question is, does this process work for us today? 
do we have these communications back and forth with God? How do we talk to God? Through prayer. How does God respond back to us, or how does God speak to us? Through His Word, right? There's not been a problem that can't be answered by, by studying God's Word. Any issue or anything we have, any problem that we face, we cannot gain a, a fresh perspective by examining and studying uh, God's Word, right? Anytime, anytime I've got, we always talk about hills and valleys, peaks and valleys. Anytime I've been in a valley, anytime I've been struggling, I have yet to, in my study, find a verse that I can't cling to and that gives me hope, right? And so that process works today. But what happens oftentimes, right? What happens when we get discouraged? Responses. We focus on our problem, right? Uh, my wife will tell you, I'm one of those that if I'm struggling with something, it's silence. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to share. I don't want to share my feelings. I don't want to. We go dark. Others, uh, we dwell on it. Others want to share, right? But oftentimes what we don't do is we don't go to God in prayer, right? That's the first thing we do is we go to God in prayer. You know, in the, in the prayer class, and it's actually been talked about in this class, right, about Hezekiah, how he just laid the letter out for the Lord to see, right? He took those problems and he laid it out. And then we go and we make sure that we, that we study. So let's talk a little bit more about, uh, about his problem. If somebody would, could you read Habakkuk verses 2 through 4? O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. And the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. So listen. Oh Lord, how long? How many of us have had that in our prayer? How many of us have prayed to God and said, How long am I going to have to endure this? Or, or how long is this going to go through? How many of our prayers have started with that simple word of how long? Right? How long uh, is, and we're going to have to go through this situation. I think Habakkuk is such a great example for us because I think oftentimes we feel that same that same way, right? Uh, it might be, you know, it might be due to our health, uh, due to our jobs, due to our relationships, just due to life in general, right? But oftentimes we feel like Habakkuk where we kind of get overwhelmed. And so we ask the Lord, how long? How long is it going to go? He doesn't wait long. Habakkuk doesn't wait long because he gets his answer in verse 5. Somebody read verse 5 for me. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe in. All right. So God says, tells Habakkuk, wait. Wait and look. Look among the nations, and you're going to be astonished because something's going to happen that if you didn't see it, you wouldn't believe it, right? Now, most of us, most of us think that's going to be something good. If we know somebody who's struggling through something, what's normally our first words of encouragement? 
things are going to get what? Better. Things are going to get better. Just hang tough. Things are going to get better. But that's not what God is about to tell Habakkuk. What God's telling, about to tell Habakkuk is it's going to get a whole lot worse. And in fact, it's going to get so worse, you won't believe me unless you see it. The Babylonians, right, this group from a, uh, that took over Assyria, some translations will call them the Chaldeans, they're about to come and carry the entire country of Judah off captivity. Okay? He tells Habakkuk, he doesn't tell Habakkuk, just wait, things get a lot better. He tells Habakkuk, things are going to get worse. And they're going to be a lot worse for a long time before they ever get better. Okay? I don't think that's what Habakkuk uh, wanted to hear, right? God's plan was that he was going to use the Babylonians to punish uh, Judah and the Israelites. How do you think Habakkuk felt about this revelation that, uh, that God gave him? Because, you know, the things, things haven't changed a lot in that the Babylonians were bad, wicked people, right? And so they were far worse. And I'm sure Habakkuk was thinking, I know we're bad, right? I know Judah's turned its back to you, but we are not near as bad as the Babylonians, right? We're not near as bad uh, as they are, right? Uh, so to Habakkuk, it really didn't make any sense. In fact, it even, it even confused him a little bit more of why God would allow that to happen uh, to his people. So what we see is Habakkuk comes back with this question in verses 12 uh, through 17, where he's complaining, right? And he, he, we're not going to read that section. Well, no, if somebody go ahead and read uh, verses 12 through 17. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? So you hear Habakkuk just not understand, right? If... First of all, he tells God, I see that you see the long picture. You see the big picture. You look long term. But how can you use, how can someone who's so good use someone so wicked like the Babylonians, right? So Habakkuk has all these questions. But fundamentally, what is Habakkuk struggling, what's the question that Habakkuk is struggling with that everyone in this room has probably struggled with it at some point in their life. Why do bad things happen to good people? Yeah. Why does God allow these bad things to happen? Why does God allow bad things happen to us? Right? We've we've we're committed. We're we're followers. Why does God allow that to happen? Why does life why does life seem so unfair? Why, why do wrong people sometimes win? Right? Habakkuk is asking these questions. And that's what that whole verse, those five verses do, is Habakkuk follows up with this confusion of how could God allow the Babylonians to do uh, such a thing, right? And if we, look at, if we look at those questions that he's asking, all of us, right? 
all of us have experienced some of these, these questions in our life. So God doesn't respond back very long. Uh, somebody read for me uh, 2, verses 2 and 3. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For a vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because surely it will come. It will not tarry. All right, so listen to what God says. God says, write this down. Write this down on tablets for everyone to read it, right? Uh, things happen at their appointed time. There's a sequence of events. God's in control of those events. And man's not going to hasten it, nor is he going to slow it down. It's all going to come to pass at his time. So what God's telling Habakkuk is when life doesn't make sense, when we ask those questions, we got to wait, right? We got to wait and we got to do something else. And we'll talk about it next slide. But what God's telling Habakkuk is look, I'm in control. Write it down, okay? Write it down on tablet, on stone. Things happen in my time frame, not necessarily your time frame. What is it? Romans 8.28. Probably one of the most quoted and one of the most misquoted verses that we use. But what's Romans 8, 28? All things... All right. How do we... How is that verse misinterpreted? When I say it's probably one of the most misinterpreted, misquoted verses. Why, why do you think I say that? What, how is it misquoted? And everything we're the ones who judge whether it's good or bad, right? God says everything happens, it, it happens for good, but it's along my will or it's, it's what I think is good, not necessarily what you think is good. But that's what he's trying to tell Habakkuk, right? Is that he... Everything is going to work out the way he's formed it with the purpose of whatever his will is. And so when we're in those valleys, you, just, you have to wait. You have to, have to wake it or, or walk it through. And so that comes to the second, the main point in the book of Habakkuk, and that is, uh, how do we do that? Somebody read for me Habakkuk 2.4. His soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. All right. This is the key verse to the whole book of Habakkuk. And that is, the righteous shall live by faith. When do we become cognizant? When do we become aware of our faith? At what point in our lives? Is it when things are all smooth sailing? Right? When there's no storm? Or do we become more aware of our faith during those stormy times? It's the stormy times, right? And it's in a way, it's kind of bad because oftentimes we don't we don't understand faith until something goes wrong, right? Until things maybe go awry, right? You know, faith is that whole idea of relying on God uh, during those during those times. And so we've got to learn to trust him because what this verse tells us is those who please God, the righteous, they must live by faith. Now, one of the things that I think is pretty interesting, right? Uh, next quarter, I'm going to, we're going to be studying some topics from the Old Testament. You know, oftentimes we have this... Uh, so when I was in high school... When I was a teenager, the church we went to gave me two Bibles. They gave me one Bible when I was baptized, and they gave me another Bible when I graduated from high school. The Bible they gave me when I graduated high school, some of you who remind me, remember, it was the New Testament, 
and Psalms, right? It, it's like oftentimes we don't acknowledge necessarily that Old Testament. But it's really interesting to me is that if we go back to Moses, right? Moses, through the Holy Spirit, through God's providence, he issued 613 different commands for them to obey. And as we go closer to the New Testament, what do we see? Well, David took those 613 commands, summarized them, and came up with 11. Summarized them into 11. If we go to Micah, in Micah 6, 8, he boiled them down to three. If we go to Isaiah 41, 1, he reduced them to two. And now Habakkuk says one command that the, the righteous shall live in faith. We read that in the book of Hebrews, in the book of Romans, and the book of Galatians, right? Corresponds, it sums up so much of the teachings in the New Testament that we have to live by faith. And so that's what he tells, that's what Habakkuk finds out. But there's more, right? Well, before we go on the faith, so if you don't know this by now, I, I love teaching on Wednesdays because I like having people from different ages, different connect groups, different points in their journey, right? But if you don't know by now, there's going to come a time in your life where all you have is faith. You can't figure out things, right? I'm one of those that I like knowing how it works. I want to figure it out. You can't solve the problems. I'm a problem solver. Christmas Eve day, my wife complained about the pantry, how it wasn't organized, didn't have any room. Spent all last week, ripped out her pantry, put a new one in, right? It's got an appliance tower. It's got where everything has a place. I like fixing it. That was a problem to her, so I wanted to fix it. But what we find is there are certain things where, where we can't solve the problems, right? It's not with us to solve that issue. We, we don't have the answers. We can't explain. We don't know why we're having to go through this certain thing. We don't know why a loved one is going through a certain thing. We, we just don't have any answers. And we got to rely on faith. Even though we don't have any of these, we always have God. People always ask me, Mike, what's your favorite verse? Which is very difficult for me because my favorite verse is oftentimes driven by what I'm going through, right? 2020, all of us were dealing with COVID, right? In May of 2020, uh, my dad, was diagnosed with cancer. Didn't want to leave Paris, Tennessee. Couldn't make him leave Paris, Tennessee. No one lived in Paris, Tennessee, but my dad, okay? At the same time, my sister is in year five of ovarian cancer. There were many days where I left after work, drove the three and a half hours to dad's, spent the night at dad's, we left at 4.30 in the morning to get him to a chemo treatment in Nashville. That treatment was four hours. While he was doing the treatment, I was doing whatever my sister needed me to do. Once his treatment was over with at 1 or 2 p.m., I would drive him Nashville home to Paris, two and a half hours, make sure he was settled in, and then drive back home, okay? Spent a lot of time on the road. This was the verse. This was the verse that was on my post-it note. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Doesn't give me any answers. Doesn't tell me necessarily how to fix the problem. Doesn't tell me how to figure out things on the own. Simply trust the Lord with all your heart. Because I think what we have to realize when we're this time, I would rather be in the hands of he who have all the answers than to have all the answers in my hand. Right? We've got to learn that at certain times, we, we just got to, we got to live by faith. We got to uh, do that. Also, during those times, we got to realize we're not alone. 
I try to always make sure I was home on Wednesdays because the elders and I would go to a room and they would pray for me and pray for my dad, pray for my sister. You know, she passed in October 2020. My nieces couldn't tell my dad. Hardest thing I think I've ever done is to tell him that his little girl, his daughter has passed. How do you get through that? How, how, do, how do you get through your, those health issues that you have or those losses that you face? Or how do you get through those things unless you have faith, right? Unless you can depend on that faith. Unless you trust in the Lord with all your heart. And you wait. And you give it time. So he sees it through. But God wasn't done with his answer to Habakkuk. Uh, somebody read for me Habakkuk 2, verses 12 through 14. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and found the city of iniquity. Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So two things in this verse that God makes clear to Habakkuk. The first thing is, he's not letting the Babylonians off. Okay, He's used the Babylonians to punish Judah and punish his people, but he's not going to let them off the hook. Right, That the Babylonians are going to be judged, the evil is going to be judged, and the wrongs are eventually going to be righted through his time frame. The second thing that we notice in this verse is this, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. What do you think this is a prophecy of? Jesus Christ, right? This is where God sums up his whole plan. His whole plan from the beginning to the end is that ultimately, right, ultimately, Everything works in his plan, and there's going to come a time when the whole earth is going to know the glory of God. Right? The whole earth is going to wind up being blessed. And this is a prophecy, a Masonic, a Masonic prophecy of Jesus Christ. And then one of my favorite verses, which uh, I think is when we go through it in a minute, if you're a parent, you've often probably told kids this, your kids this, right? is look at verse 20. God sums all this up. 12 through 14, God gives him all this thing, and then God closes with, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Right? God's telling Habakkuk, this is my plan. I have a plan. I'm in control. Now I'm going to go to my temple, and y'all just keep quiet about it. Right? In other words, what God's telling Habakkuk is to settle down. Right? Don't look necessarily at what's going on today. He's telling them to stay calm. Right? He's telling them don't panic and don't give up. Right? I'm in control. I have a plan. And that was a great comfort to, uh, to Habakkuk. So let's kind of move to Habakkuk's conclusion. And this kind of takes us into chapter, chapter 3, right? What we notice is his perspective has changed, right? Ask God, God answers, wants clarification, God replies back, he processes it all, and now his perspective has changed. And he writes, it's actually a hymn, it's actually a song, right? How many, you know, if you guys looked at some of the, especially the older hymns, Oftentimes they were written in response to something that's happened to somebody or things like that, right? But here Habakkuk, he writes a, he writes a hymn, he writes a song of praise. Uh, and let's take a look at verses uh, 17 and 18. Somebody read for that, uh, read, read that for me, please. When the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Anybody 
Anybody grow up on a farm or have grandparents had a farm? So to me, uh, so my son-in-law, Will, his grandfather has thousands of acres in Arkansas, right? But I just imagine that life, right, of, of if you don't get enough rain or there's pests or things like that, right? Your, your livelihood is, to me, is so, uh, it's based on, there's so many things that could go wrong. And so Habakkuk, here's all that God has said, right? And he writes his hymn, right? The fig tree might not blossom. If it doesn't blossom, what does that mean? You're not going to get no figs. Nor fruit on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock is cut off. There's no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will take joy uh, in the God of my salvation. So what you see is he took God at his word and he's decided to live by faith. All his anxiety, all his troubles, uh, he's changed those, right? But not only has he said he's going to live by faith, but he's going to do so joyfully. There's a lot of things we accept Right? A lot of bad things that happen and we accept those. But are we joyful in our acceptance? Or are we joyful uh, in what happens, right? What is this, what does Habakkuk learn about joy? Not dependent on your circumstances. Habakkuk learns joy has nothing to do with what's going on with me in the present. Joy is the fact that I have a salvation, that I have a Savior, right? How does this relate? We talked about it uh, Sunday. How does this relate to James uh, 1, 2 through 4? I know uh, Andrew talked about it in his sermon, right? James tells it, us to do what? Count it all joy. How do we, how do we necessarily do that? Do you think? Well, you have to take the uh, "I need to understand" out of it, and just have the faith that God is in control and He has a plan. What can we? What should we do during these times? Pray and wait, and I will add, study. Read our Bible, right? Uh, any, any problem we have that drives us into God's Word to study it is probably worth the stresses that come along with that problem, right? The only way we grow, and I've said this before, is we shouldn't study the Bible to know. It's not about knowledge, but we should study the Bible to grow. That's how we grow spiritually, is through study. And so we count it joy, but it's also that we just don't necessarily sit there on our hands and wait. How we are active is in prayer and in Bible study. And those are the things uh, that we've got to do. We, we've got to move Right? Oftentimes when we're in that valley, we use this term and, and you know, sometimes we give ourselves good advice, sometimes we don't get our, give ourselves good advice. Oftentimes we'll tell someone, well, you know what? You just got to batten down the hatches and wait for the storm. So sometimes we face these things we're going through and our, our goal is, you know what? I just want to endure it, right? And so we kind of set that jaw and, you know, we endure it. But what Habakkuk says is he's going to not only endure it, but he's going to be joyful in the process. And I think that's very, very important uh, for us. So let's go back. We talked about that all our lessons deal with strength. And so the verse is verse 19. 
God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread uh, on high places. What, what is this, after knowing the context, what does this mean, or, or what does this mean to you? I'm reminded of Jonathan's class. You guys remember what his class was on? Something to do with eagles, right? Mount, mount on the wings of eagles. What Habakkuk is saying is, the God is my strength. He's going to make my feet like the deer. He's going to make my feet like, you know, where I can run. I can jump and run on the mountaintops. I'm out of the valley and I'm on the mountaintops. And that's where we get our strength. How do we continue through? How do we get through the valleys? God provides us the strength. And you know what? It's only by the cross. It's only because of the crucifixion and the resurrection that we can go from dreading the low points in life to walking the peaks, right? It's only because of the resurrection of Jesus that we can mount on those wings of eagles, that we can run like the deer in the mountaintops. It's only through that. Where do we get joy to, after we endure all these things? is because we have that salvation. We have that Savior, right? We know that whatever we're going through, God has a plan, has His time. We wait for it. But we also know we've got something waiting for us. I told this story in prayer, right? So uh, on Saturday, uh, the 19th of September, I took my dad to the emergency room, having trouble breathing. So the doctor, the, the, they went to put him in the ICU, and the doctor said, well, Mr. Baker, what do you want? i got to ask this. I don't expect this to happen, but i got to ask. What do you want me to do if your heart stops? So my dad looked at him and goes, well, I don't want you to turn around and leave the room. <laughs> but he goes, but I have a mansion waiting, so I don't want you to, I don't want to wait any longer. And then he passed on Monday, right? He, he knew he had something waiting for him, that this life was temporary. Whatever we're going through, even though it seems like it's the, the it's going to be the, it's, even though we don't ever necessarily see the end in sight, right? We still know there's something better that's waiting for us. And so for me, when I read, you know, when we go and we, we read Habakkuk, when we read these, these passages of strength, life is hard, right? Uh, life is, you know, it's complex. You, you can't make it without strength. And the strength comes from God. And He gives us strength regardless of what circumstance that we are in life. When we're going through those, when we're asking those questions that Habakkuk asked, we got to understand that God is there for us and He can provide us strength. Any comments? You know, even, even in the midst of these trials and in the valleys and in the bad times, God will be glorified in all things. Uh, take the accident to that young man Monday night. It was terrible. It was a bad thing. But what did we see? Guys knelt down on the field, black and white, bright, uh, bills and, and bingles, all together, huddled together, praying for this young man. A couple hours later, a guy on ESPN, one of the commentators, bowed his head and said a prayer on ESPN, uh, on national TV. Would we have ever thought that would, be hap that would have happened? Probably not. But God will be glorified in all things, whether how bad they happen, that happened to us. When we're, when we're in the midst of that, just know that God will be glorified when you come out of this. Amen. <coughs> any, other, any other comments? When I think of Romans 8, 28, um, and it can for sure be misinterpreted, but it's kind of like what your dad said. 
at the end of his life is that we know that even if we never actually understand in this life, that in the end, all things are going to work together for good, and that being heaven is going to be the best good that we could ever imagine. And that's something that I try to keep in mind, because, you know, James, we talked about James earlier, it talks about, like, how our life is just like a vapor here on earth. Um, and I'm sure, like, once we get to heaven, we'll have an actual understanding of that, and just realize that all the problems here are so minuscule in comparison to what we have coming. And so I, I try to keep that in mind the best I can, even with my limited understanding. I've never seen it before. But. And, you know, I, I think we have that faith and we wait. You know, Habakkuk never saw all the things that God described, right? But it still encouraged him to where he would have joy, he'd have faith in God, that God was in control, God had a plan. So this week, it's only three chapters, all short, your homework is, is to read Habakkuk all the way through. It's a great little book. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time we have to come together and study from your word. Father, we're thankful for all these passages that you've given us that, that help us to understand where our strength can come from. Father, we ask that you be with those uh, within our family who are struggling and that you give them, give them strength. Father, we ask you to be with those who... Uh, have recently lost loved ones who are dealing with health issues. Father, we ask that you be with them. We ask that you be with us through the rest of this week. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.